Hey, this is Sean with the Rockaway Church. Glad you are able to watch our video of our online services. Uh, we pray that it's a blessing to you. Uh, we are also praying that the, that the preaching of God's word is a blessing to you. Uh, one cautionary note is uh, even though we desire this to be a blessing, we also ask that you would not use this as a substitute for, uh, for authentic fellowship. We believe that God has gifted each and every Christian with uh, gifts and that they are to show up and gift the people of God in the capacity that he's enabled them to do that. So if you're unable to attend a service somewhere uh, or if you're sick or if you're uh, nowhere near a church, uh, we're glad this is a blessing to you. Uh, if you're not a Christian, we would say uh, consider uh, what we have to say. And uh, we also uh, would ask that you not judge us according to uh, perhaps uh, other uh, so-called Christian beliefs. Um, so anyhow, we, uh, we have our own mistakes. So come and judge us uh, by that standard. And uh, by all means, you're always welcome uh, Sunday mornings at 1030. So again, we thank you and uh, may God richly bless you. Morning, church family, and uh, happy Palm Sunday. Yeah, it's a great week up ahead of us. Got our, um, our Good Friday service on Friday. I get to see everybody an extra day, and we get to celebrate the death of our Lord for our sins, and then we get to celebrate his resurrection on Resurrection Sunday, the following Sunday. It's just, it's a great, great week. So, um, Welcome if you're joining us online, and uh, I hope my voice holds out. I sang with several of you at the Care Center yesterday. It was great, sang some of the classic hymns of the faith, and, and a lot of the residents uh, I saw singing along with this. That was wonderful, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, sang, of course, this morning with all of you, and then uh, taught Sunday school this morning because David and Franny are out of town for a little break, and so uh, thankfully, though, I got to... I got to sit and watch some of the Sunday school with you while a dead guy taught for about 30 minutes because uh, it's a video series with R.C. Sproul. So, at the, yeah, that's right, Renee. So, yeah, I got a little 30-minute break in there, but I uh, pray my voice holds out this morning. So, I, uh, as you all know, I'm a bit of a demonstrative person, so I, I, I tend to sing loud because singing's a gift, right? That's what we do. We praise our God as uh, Lewis was uh, exhorting us from Psalm 113. So uh, we are still working our way through uh, Genesis 21. So just by uh, way of uh, reminder, we were two weeks in the first uh, section of Genesis 21. That took us through uh, verse 21 of chapter 21. So Lord willing, we will uh, work our way to the end of the chapter today. So... Uh, if you're a guest with us, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, we preach through books of the Bible. We're going through the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, as the uh, sign says. So let's, uh, let's spend a little time in prayer, and then uh, let's look at the text and see, uh, see what, would, uh, what the Spirit would reveal so that it's not just letters on a page. Um, quick question before we pray. Who all has been here through the bulk of the teaching in Genesis? Show of hands. Yeah, okay, three quarters, 80% maybe. Um, who all has had, um, like, whoa, never noticed that before, or never thought, like, thought of the text in that manner before? Same show of hands. Yeah, same, by the way. But <laughs> this has been an amazing study for me as your uh, servant teacher. So um, the reason that you've been able to raise your hand like that, is because the Spirit of God is the ultimate teacher. Amen. Right? So uh, that's why we can praise him. One more aspect, that he is a good teacher. He is a perfect teacher. 
using imperfect people like us, imperfect minds. So let's, the reason I wanted to ask that is let's praise God for that in our prayers. As you know, we like to do a time of silent prayer. And, um, and let's ask God yet again to continue to teach us and mold us by his word. So let's spend some silent prayer and then I'll close us out and then we'll look at Genesis 21. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, blessed be your name. Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive all praise and glory and honor. Father, we praise you that your relationship to us, your people, is a dynamic one that you bring about the fruit of righteousness in your people, that your spirit indwells us, leads us, directs us, even teaches us. And Lord Jesus, you intercede for us with perfect intercession. Father, thank you that there is perfect triune ministry to your church. Lord, in the mystery of your wisdom and sovereignty, you use imperfect people Lord, as we looked at earlier in Sunday school, that you use the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Father, thank you for using us. Thank you for edifying us, for pointing us to your Son and his perfect work as the means of our justification before you. So I ask, Lord, that your Son's death and resurrection would not remain a distant memory in our minds, that it would not be a a desire of our heart that is, seems far from us, but yet it would be near. And that your Holy Spirit would instruct us yet again in your perfect word. Please help us yet again this morning for the sake of your name and the good of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, the word of God in Genesis 21, 22 to 34 says this. <clears throat> At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, 
I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs apart, seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that it may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the army, of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk, tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. The word of the living God. Amen. So as we work our way through the Genesis narrative, you'll notice from chapter 20, verse 1, through the end of chapter 21, this has mostly involved Abimelech and his interactions with Abraham. The only exception being chapter 21, verses 1 to 21, which is really a bit of a parenthetical portion. It's an important one, but it's a bit of a parenthesis of, within the narrative that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. And if you remember from last week, the narrative signed off regarding Ishmael because he will not be mentioned again with any sort of meaningful substance. You know, he comes back kind of in brief in chapter 25 to bury Abraham uh, along with his brother, but we won't hear much about him the rest of the book. And of course, Ishmael then heads down into Haran, so he and his descendants will have no inheritance of the land. He, he gets a land inheritance, but he doesn't get the inheritance promised to Abraham, okay? Just like God said. When we were talking about how God's governing human interactions, right? People are moving around, and Ishmael ends up over here. You know, Isaac's going to end up over here. God is governing that. And today we'll look at a portion of the text that turns our attention away from the boys and back to Abimelech and Abraham. So take note, chapter 20, verse 18 says this, for the Lord had closed all of the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Then, chapter 21, verse 22 says this, at that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. So, in between these two verses, Sarah, as we've noted over the last couple of weeks, Sarah gives birth to Isaac. They throw a party, remember, when he was weaned. Abraham sends out Hagar and Ishmael. Ishmael ends up down in Paran. Now, that all that took place between those two verses, okay? And we don't know exactly how much time has elapsed between chapter 20, verse 18, and chapter 21, verse 22. We don't know how much time is in there. Probably about three to four years. Just, just you know, surmising some of the time stamps and the ages of the boys, etc. About three or four years. And even though God has granted peace between Abraham and Abimelech, and Abimelech, of course, gave him verbal permission to go dwell in the land, right? There's some skirmishes between Abraham and some of Abimelech's men. So, beloved, just to pause and maybe just a quick side note there, there will always be a measure of conflict between people in a fallen world. Okay? We need to have reasonable expectations about our environment that we dwell in currently. That's why we hope in a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, A utopia here, there will always be, that's not going to happen. There'll, there'll be a Christian influence right, to push back on the darkness of this world. But, but don't expect, have a reasonable expectation 
that you will have issues with people. So what does the Bible say to Christians about that? Romans 12, 18. If possible, it says, so far as it depends on you, believer, live live peaceably with all. So if you were listening carefully as I was reciting that verse, you would have picked up on those two words, if possible. Meaning it may not always be possible. But so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. In other words, there might be some people that are at enmity with you people that you just can't seem to reconcile with. See, if that exists, it just can't be because of you. That, that's what he's saying. So, in a room full of people like this, let me just toss this out here. Is there someone you need to seek peace with and be restored to? So Abraham here, back to the narrative. Abraham here, he's been experiencing some conflict with his landlord's people. And this could be a problem because the landlord, Abimelech, and we'll call him his apartment manager, Phicol, they they knew what happened to the kings who opposed Abraham. Remember when he went to go rescue Lot back in chapter 14? Now, the author of Hebrews provides a commentary on that. It says, Abraham slaughtered them. Also, he was certainly, most most certainly, aware of what Abraham's God did to Sodom and Gomorrah, chapter 19. And even more recent, Abimelech himself felt the fringes of judgment of Abraham's God in chapter 20. So, Abimelech is no fool. Better go make things right. Verse 22 again. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you deal with me and the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. Okay, so these two men of authority, remember this is, he's the king of Gerar and the head of his army, these two men of authority go to Abraham and they essentially seek a permanent non-aggression act. Those things still take place today. So why do they seek this from Abraham? Well, because when Abraham goes into battle and there's conflict, he doesn't lose. So these men know why, though. Like, why doesn't Abraham uh, ever fail in, in battle? Well, they know why. Because they said at the end of verse 22, see the phrase, God is with you in all that you do. Now, for, for us as Christians, we won't always enjoy success, at, at least how the world defines it. But our unbelieving friends should be able to observe God's work in our lives. Now, whether or not they agree with our convictions as as followers of Christ, that's another matter altogether. But they should be able to see that God is with you in all that you do. More on that in a moment. But here, the other reason these men go to Abraham Abraham has a track record of not being forthright in all matters. And of course, the consequences of that led to, you know, wherever land he was sojourning in, they felt the consequences of that. We saw that down in Egypt with, with, with the king of Egypt. And we see that here with Abimelech. So Abimelech says in verse 23, now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or my posterity. So he's essentially saying, Abraham, don't be deceitful with me again. 
And, and don't just swear to me. Notice Abimelech goes for the jugular. Swear to me by God, he says. From a pagan king. That Hebrew word, by the way, in the original text is Elohim. We're familiar with that word, right? That's the God of Abraham. So, beloved, here's a takeaway for us. Sometimes it's good for our unbelieving friends to force us to toe the line when it comes to us living our faith to the, in the living God, right? See, it's not always a bad thing if a person says to you, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian. Sometimes that's good for us to hear that if our actions or our words are inconsistent with our profession of faith. See, God can use anybody to, to facilitate repentance. We're acknowledging the sovereignty of God over all of these people. So, one could argue, Abraham has certainly walked in consistency at times. We've seen this throughout this section from chapter 12 on. One day he believes in God, another day he doubts. You know, one day he's defeating kings and he's rescuing Lot. The next day he's being deceptive as to the true relationship that he has with his sister. I mean wife. And that's why it's good for us, beloved. It's good for us to examine the scriptures and to see how people of faith exercise their faith in the living God. Because, see, if Abraham believed but also stumbled... So will you. So will I. And yes, we will tell pe the people of God's love through the cross of Jesus Christ that he died for us and that God in great power and authority raised him from the dead to give the hope of eternal life to whoever believes. That is the good news. Yet, sometimes the decisions that we make are totally inconsistent with that glorious reality because of our sin nature, like Abraham did. And you know what? The unbelievers around us, they see that clear as day. And if they don't know you're a Christian, well, that's another issue. But if they know you're a Christian and are like, hey, wait a minute, that's good for us to hear that. So, Abraham agrees to swear to this, this oath that Abimelech brings. And take note, the covenant that's put forth, Abraham engages in that. Okay, this is something, Abimelech asks for kind of a verbal agreement, Abraham initiates with a covenant. This is, I would argue, an act of faith in the living God, what he does here. And you might say, well, how so? Well, notice in verse 23, Abimelech asks for this to be extended to his descendants and his posterity, that is, his future generations. And you might think, well, wait a minute. I've been following along. I've been reading ahead. I've been studying Genesis. I thought Abraham's descendants are going to inherit this land. Oh, they will. After 400 years, though, remember that? When God promised him that back in Genesis chapter 15, that was verses 14 to 16. So Abraham is trusting God with this promise, even though Abimelech seems to be kind of hedging his bets here. And he's not taking, he's not taking issue with what Abimelech does. So... Was there conflict going on the land brought up in this conversation? Yes. And as we've already noted, Abraham and Sarah's deception brought about a curse upon Abimelech and his people. Don't want that happening again. But also, look at verse 25. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about the well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So, if you remember, Abimelech gives Abraham permission to dwell in the land. He did that back in chapter 20 and verse 15. Abraham then takes time and some effort to go dig a well. Remember, he had a lot of flocks. 
He had a, a lot of animals. He had herdsmen, need water to survive, you know. But then Abimelech's men come and take it. And of course, Abimelech's men make sure that their boss doesn't really catch wind of this, this little skirmish going on. But Abraham, being the man of peace that he is, rather than seeking restitution or rushing to go to war, that got things done in the past, he doesn't rush to that. He takes the initiative to pursue peace through the covenant. Verse 27. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. So let's look at this first very plainly. This is something Abraham is initiating, as we've already noted, and it's costing him some money. Just because this is the ancient world doesn't mean that, this, that animals weren't bought and sold. This is costing him some money because he's not just giving his word, saying, well, sure, I'll swear by God, as you have said, Abimelech. No, he's moving to seal this with a covenant there's all sorts of foreshadows here, by the way, pointing forward to the new covenant. But remember, remember what ancient covenants were like back in chapter 15. If, you're, if, 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 if you don't remember that, like, check it out this week. Go back and review that. Remember, animals were killed, each divided into two, and then the binding parties, they would pass between the halves. Very graphic scene, but that's by design. Because it's as if to say, may it be done to me what has been done to these animals if I don't keep my word. Boy, we have cheapened our word today, have we not? Of course, that happened in the first century. What said Jesus says, look, you don't need to go do all of this stuff. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. But even back then, there was this graphic depiction of, of animals being killed and parted and people walking between them, looking to the left and looking to the right, going, I don't want that ha to happen to me. I will keep my word to you, sir. And Abimelech does not ask for this. But Abraham is putting it out there. Because, you know, Abimelech, he's initially confused as to why all these animals are being brought out. Look at verse 29 again. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, the place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. Now, the text, you know, there was these other animals, not just the ewe lambs. The text does not give any graphic detail about the process of dividing the animals and the covenant process. The author, most likely, assumes your memory isn't so bad that you can't remember back to chapter 12 when we first were, had a view of what a covenant is. Now, especially if you have a reputation of telling half-truths, hey, Sarah, Tell them you're my sister, which we've seen that twice. Abraham here, here's the encouraging thing for us. Abraham here is growing in his faith. Wait till we get to the next chapter, chapter 22. That'll be after Resurrection Sunday, but wait, wait till we get to that. It, there's a trajectory towards maturity in his faith. That should really encourage us. Yeah, praise God. Because... He doesn't just give Abimelech his word on a handshake. But in order to communicate that he is a man of integrity, in spite of his past track record, he is exercising his faith in the living God, and he moves to something more substantial, beloved, just like God did with him. He moved through a covenant. Like, where do you think he got that idea? From God. So here's our takeaway. Beloved, our interactions with God have a positive impact on our interactions with our fellow man. 
Let me say that again. Our interactions with God have a positive impact on our interactions with our fellow man. You see, think about, wait, think about how the gospel informs that. On, on how the fact that God pursued us to show us grace, to, to make the, the death of Christ and his resurrection real and meaningful. Now, we've experienced love beyond measure. Should we not be quick to do that with others? There's parables about that, you know about, Lord, give me all of this forgiveness, something I could never pay. And yet we're so quick to show justice over this petty matter, matter, especially with a brother or sister in the Lord. Our interactions with God have a positive effect on our interactions with each other. And (laughs) does not our walk with Christ change how we engage those around us? If not, it should. But those of you who have walked with the Lord for many years, and I know there's several of you in this room, you know this, don't you? Like, I'm, I, I'm preaching to the choir. This is, this, is how, this is how it works. My interactions with Jesus have completely changed my earthly relationships. Share these experiences with us newer believers. We need that. We need your wisdom. And if, if, if you're not in the walked with the Lord for many years group, you're with the rest of us, and you have no idea what I'm talking about, meditate on this text. Talk with those who have walked with the Lord for years. Humble yourself before the Lord and say, teach me. What have you gleaned? The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 7, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. (laughs) Look, what's Paul saying there? He's an older believer, a more mature believer, saying to young Timothy, think over the wisdom and the things that I am giving to you. Meditate on that, and the Lord will give you understanding. See, there's this human component, this human dynamic of of how older, wiser believers pour into younger believers, newer believers. And we meditate on that. We think about that, and the Lord gives understanding. Now, look at Genesis. uh, Back to Genesis here. Look at Genesis 21-32. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. So these men make a covenant at Beersheba. And I'm sure for those of you still using paper Bibles, those are still a thing, thankfully. Uh, for <laughs> I have a Bible app, but for those of you using your paper Bibles, you probably have a footnote somewhere regarding the name Beersheba. It says something like probably well of seven or the well, well of the oath or well of the sevenfold, sevenfold oath, something along those lines. Well, we have to speculate a little bit here, but we know from the biblical record, more broad-based, the number seven is often presented, not always, but often presented as the the perfect number, the full number. Speaking of the significance of this covenant, we can say at least that much. And then, based on the significance, Abraham plants a tree there. So what's with that? Well, in the ancient world, and in principle, people still do this today, when something of significance happens in a particular location, people desire a symbol of permanence to mark that occasion or that event. And when people interacted with the living God, you know, we see this throughout, especially the Old Testament, 
when people interacted with the living God, they wanted to mark that event. Whether it's planting a tree, they would often pile up stones. Today, like, what's the modern equivalent of that today? Well, we will place plaques on things, not for religious reasons, but if something significant took place, a particular battle, a particular uh, you know, social event that took place, we p- will place a plaque on a stone. Anything to communicate that something important happened here. And notice, though, Abraham is not living in the past. Let's not make that mistake and make that assumption. He's not living in the past. Something like, you know, boy, that time with God way back then, that was really something, wasn't it? So anyway, on with my life. That would be dangerous. No, notice what he does. Look at verse 33 again. It says, he called on the name of the Lord. Again, that's a phrase that's been used a bunch of times with Abraham. He doesn't give up. He does not let go. No matter how how difficult or how pleasant the circumstances are. Now, is that not a valuable lesson for you and I? He always is marked by this, when when something's happening, he calls upon the name of the Lord. The circumstances don't dictate whether or not he does that. And notice, notice Abraham addresses God as the Hebrew here, Yahovah Olam El, translated here, self-existing everlasting God. You see, beloved, this is an expression of true worship. And he starts with praising God for who he is. You're thinking, I don't know if that's very profound. It's far more profound than often we give our thought to. Not what can God do for me, but who he is. And he is eternal. That is infinite. He's self-existent. And he is El, God. You see, long before any law was given, that won't come till the book of Exodus, several hundred years later, long before any law was given, Abraham was obedient to the first commandment, to have no other gods before him. And with this God, there is nothing that stands in his way to accomplish his will. No one can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? To quote another pagan king, God is the one who has been sustaining Abraham. This is the takeaway for us, beloved. God is the one who has been sustaining Abraham. God is the one who has been keeping his promises to Abraham. And the significance of the biblical account, this is important. The significance of the biblical account is not the faithfulness of Abraham, but the faithfulness of the God of Abraham. There's a monumental difference between those two things. We have seen account after account throughout the book of, the book of Genesis of failure in God's people but yet we see the faithfulness of the God of these people. And that is true for us. Because of your faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this same God is faithful to you because it is based off his merit, not yours. And because he does what he does for his namesake, I am so thankful that he does that that he does what he does for his name's sake. Just use your little digital concordance and type those words in sometime for your namesake or for his namesake. Type that in there. (laughs) God does what he does from cover to cover in his book for his name's sake. And I'm thankful it's that way. And it is he who is working mightily in you. He's doing that in you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Just like he did here in Abraham. 
So that's why you can read this ancient text and go, yep, that I'm experiencing myself. And if you're not, he can change that. So, at the end of our text this morning, Abraham enjoys another season of peace and contentment. Look at all the problems he's had. Look at all the problems he's caused. And he's moving into another season of peace and contentment. But you know, God has never done working in us, thankfully, in our walk with him. He has never done. And when God is working in us, it often brings difficulty. And those of you who have walked with the Lord for many years, you're like, amen. He, it, it brings difficult, he brings difficult circumstances to us in order to work in us. And the Holy Spirit sanctifies us as we are walking through hardship. And by the way, this, that reality of difficulty and hardship after a season of peace, that is going to come visit Abraham in the next chapter. You, some of you have been believers for a while. You've probably heard pretty good sermons out of chapter 22, hopefully all good sermons out of chapter 22, because it so plainly and clear, clearly points to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel which is substitution, Christ in your place. But that's two weeks away. So I still want to encourage you to read ahead and, um, and be praying uh, we'll be in Matthew 27 for Good Friday, so if you want to read that. And then we'll be in Matthew chapter 28 for Resurrection Sunday. So uh, please read the last chunk of Matthew. Read all of Matthew. It's a great gospel. So uh, let's, uh, I'll, let's stop there this morning. So I understand that was not a Palm Sunday message, but something to think about that before we pray. Christ came into the city and the city and they were, you know, waving palm branches saying hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That that word we we've noted this several years ago, but that word hosanna means Lord save us. Problem is they wanted salvation from inconvenience, oppressive governments, their environment. And Jesus came to save from sin. So he meets our real need. So if there's any little punctuation on this Palm Sunday, and by the way, that's what he did for Abraham. He didn't save him to an easy life. He saved him from sin. And that's what we enjoy as Christians. So let's pray. Gracious Father, uh, thank you for this message uh, from your word that you have given to your church. Lord, we are infallible people. I am a, we are fallible people. I am a fallible man. We are wrought with problems. Our thinking is often wrong. I'm sure many of us within this church struggling with secret things, maybe not struggling with it and should be. Lord, you see each one of us. You know each one of us intimately. And Lord, might your word applied by your spirit burrow deep into our hearts and minds. Lord, I know often, and you know us perfectly, you see us perfectly. The things that we give our attention to, the ratio in which we give our attention to it, would often communicate that we don't value you as we should. So Lord, bring change to our lives, not for our sake, but for your name's sake. Let the light of Christ shine brightly through your people. 
And Lord, help us in matters of significant obedience that we would love one another as you have loved us. Transform us, Lord. Help us to praise you in truth and in spirit in all of our lives. We ask this in the blessed name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm back. Uh, glad you were able to watch our services. And again, we pray that it was a blessing to you. Um, as you can see, we are not paid professionals, but we do love Jesus deeply. So uh, as James exhorts us, uh, to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So to whom much is given, much is required. And so we ask that you would go out and uh, follow up uh, what you've heard with action. So again, may God richly bless you.